so when I first uh, submitted this this sort of abstract with with Pierre, it was uh, um, going to be focused on my my area of expertise, which is which is cell biology and molecular biology. But it kind of changed a little bit because I got introduced to some of Pierre's students, uh, Charlie and Amos, who have kind of um, developed some some other tools that I think are really illustrative of the kind of things that can be done with um, with augmented reality. So. Um, I was going to start out with kind of making a, a case for this, but I think the case was made much more convincingly by, by Ava and Nasli. Um, in, in my case, uh, I teach students um, about the molecular world, about molecular machines um, that no one really has any real world frame of reference for. Um, but the reality is, is that, um, uh, you know, molecular biology is about mechanics is about moving parts of, of proteins and, and molecular systems that accomplish tasks like anything else in the real world. Um, and so that should really be the goal, the primary learning objective of, of a, of a post-secondary education in this, in this area. Um, but um, unfortunately, because of the, you know, maybe more traditional way these topics are taught, students are left with only kind of a, a superficial or an abstract understanding of, of, of how these mechanics really um, function. And so the, the good news is, is that the truth is out there, that there's a, a wealth of information that if you could just find a way to connect it to the classroom, uh, connect it to the students' um, learning, you can overcome these barriers that, that Ava so eloquently went over about um, the, uh, the, the extraneous load, which is really their, them being tasked with converting uh, a cartoon representation into a, uh, an actual mechanical understanding of, of what they're, they're learning about. So um, everyone who teaches molecular biology knows that what students need is to understand how you know, molecular machines work. This is a protein. This is a, most of you will obviously recognize this as, a, as an adenylate cyclase molecule and complex with a G-alpha subunit, which activates it. And so when you're tasked with teaching students how this system works, you want them to uh, paint a picture for themselves that looks like this, but this is what you're showing them on on the the lecture slide. And so after a while, when there's you know several you know hundred thousand different proteins that can be made by a human cell, and all of them are represented by these sort of globular oval structures, it can become an enormous barrier to them understanding how these machines really work. So. Um, as I said, the good news is, is there are literally hundreds of thousands of atomically accurate structures that are freely available in publicly accessible databases. So I'm showing here just kind of the home pages for the Protein Data Bank and the, uh, the EM data resource. Um, and so this data is coming out all the time, and this is really what should be used to teach students how molecular mechanics works. Um, and so as, as Nasli pointed out, um, all of this technology for augmented reality, what it works is simply on a smartphone or a tablet, they recognize target objects, whether that be a, um, a you know, lecture slide or a flashcard, and they load some kind of digital asset, some kind of animation or 3D object. So if this opens up, hopefully you can see me, I'm right here. So I'm gonna take my, my, uh, my camera and I'm gonna point it at a, a target object. Okay, so this would be an example of say a flashcard that has some information or maybe a lecture slide. And this is a, a, a 3D model of a human embryo. So, you can interact with it, you can look at its different features. And the nice thing about this little, little app that I made is that you can use it almost as a little bit of a virtual ultrasound. So the closer I get, I can see the internal structures of the, of the model and explore it kind of on my own time. And so this is the kind of an example of the type of app you might use for individual study, okay? One of the things that's kind of difficult in, in any kind of physical context is to, is to communicate um, the idea of a helix, right? It's hard to represent a helix in its proper uh, proportions in three dimensions. So this is an animation of two strands of DNA folding around each other. Sorry, my hand has got a little bit of shakes here, probably too much coffee this morning. Um, and so I have a model here of a double helix of DNA. You know, you can look all around it. It's got different features lit up. So these are kind of high content apps where you can show the hydrogen bonds between the bases, the anti-parallel nature of the strands, and then there's one more section to this animation where you can kind of see the, the different base pairs, so the adenine and thymine and, and guanine and cytosine. So that's another one. I'll quickly go through two more so we can get to Charlie and Amos here. So this is another one 
of a transfer RNA, which is always shown in a certain way in a classroom in every textbook. Okay. And so what I am able to show my students is that if that is how a, a tRNA, a transfer RNA is shown in, in, a, in a textbook or classroom context, what it really looks like is a polymer of nucleic acids, which if I wait long enough, will fold into the actual three-dimensional structure. And so they can explore how, you know, the, the different features of the tRNA actually uh, uh, emerge from the folding of the of the molecule into a, a three-dimensional object and then i have one more so this is a nucleosome um, which is a uh, basically a molecular spool so that yellow up there is a is a length of dna and this is uh what's called a nucleosome structure it's made up of different histone proteins so there's eight of them and you can make them animate out like that so you can show the students what the the, the building blocks are they come back together to form that spool, and then the DNA wraps around it. And that's what allows three meters of DNA to be very tightly compacted into the nucleus of a obviously very tiny cell. I just want to very quickly acknowledge some of the, the same uh, people that Nasli and, and, and Ava mentioned. Obviously, my, my journey on this started with cognitive projections. They helped me out with my first apps. And uh, now I'm working in the academic technologies offices, continuing some of this work. And... Um, Thank you very much. I'll kick it over to Charlie and Nemus. Um, so I just want to say good morning, everyone. Uh, so Charlie and I have, today will be presenting to you about uh, our exploration uh, and the possibilities of bringing AR and XR into the faculty area, uh, faculty of engineering to provide a new type of uh, experiential learning. Um, although remote learning uh, specifically for engineering uh, kind of originated from the pandemic, um, we believe that there's a great value in bringing AR and XR into the classroom permanently as well. Um, this would allow for students to view complex models right at their fingertips, as well as being able to interact uh, with the components of the model. Uh, this would uh, allow for an opportunity to manipulate the model in a way that wouldn't really be possible in the real world. Uh, an example of that would be like removing an engine block to view the inner components while it's actually still running, all of which would provide a new method uh, and learning and teaching uh, that's not really exercised widely currently. So we really feel like traditional learning is lacking in these areas, and this type of interactive activity could provide massive improvements. As we all know, on paper, examples are static, and they have a fixed perspective to view them from. This can be difficult to interpret and comprehend what is being conveyed and causes confusion, especially when trying to illustrate an aspect of a 3D model rather than something on a 2D plane on paper. Uh, in this 2D illustration, we cannot rotate the view to view it from any other perspective. Uh, this type of image can be difficult to view the depth of objects. For instance, here is the sway bar more forward than the axles are not, and also where is it even connected? Um, so we just have an example of the exact same picture, but in 3D and AR. And so now that it's in AR and that we've put it into the real world, it's a lot easier to see the positioning and orientation as well as position of everything. So in the same uh, picture, we can see where the ex uh, sway bar is exactly at. It's aligned with the axles. Um, so once we're able to put it into an augmented reality, we're able to see uh, the different uh, specific animations and details um, much uh, further and uh, much clearer. Um, so what is the value proposition of it, uh, of us bringing it into uh, um, the Faculty of Engineering? And so, um, as previously mentioned, uh, this will allow for students and professors to conceptualize complicated objects uh, a lot simpler. Um, it could also reduce financial strain on expensive equipment. Um, for example, uh, specifically in a course in mechanical engineering, uh, we have dissection labs. And so um, there's a group of six or seven students uh, who are given an object to disassemble, um, but obviously, uh, it, it would be really, uh, it'd be a really financial strain to give every student uh, that object to disassemble. And so using AR, um, each student would be able to disassemble their own object. And uh, this could also introduce a new technique uh, to conceptualize assessments as well as exams. Um, as we create, uh, as we see exams, um, there's always an image who's, uh, which is printed in black and white. And sometimes it's really unclear to actually see what's being portrayed. And so if these models were put into AR, or extended reality would be able to clearly indicate the specific details uh, that are being portrayed. This is a 2D illustration of an epicyclic gear train or more commonly called a planetary gear. They're heavily used in engineering applications for two reasons. One is that there's a very large 
gear ratio obtainable in a very small package. And the other is that a planetary gear allows for multiple configurations to allow uh, to achieve different ratios. So the outer gear is the ring gear. And then that center gear is called the sun gear. And the three gears that are around it are the planet gears. So the first configuration listed, all the gears are just able to rotate freely about their respective axes. In the second configuration, we can fix the ring gear, which will now allow the planet gears to orbit the sun gear, as well as while they're rotating about their own axes. And then in the last configuration, we can fix the sun gear, which will, the planets will still be orbiting the sun, but now the ring gear will be rotating with that. So now we can see the same example but in the original state here is freewheeling. So everything is able just to rotate freely about its own axes. And then from this drop down, we can change the configuration. So now we can fix the ring gear and see how these planet gears orbit around the sun. And then in the third configuration, we can fix the sun gear and see how the planets are still orbiting the sun, but this allows the ring gear to rotate with them. And then, um, in AR, we can also do things like vary, um, vary the speed. And uh, in other examples, this may be the friction, coefficient of friction or the number of teeth on the gears. Uh, this is something that would not be capable in uh, the real world. That's uh, it for our presentation today. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions at the end, please don't hesitate to ask.